So I'll be working today with the Windows version of Max QDA 2020. As before, the Apple Mac version is almost identical. The changes from Max QDA 2018 to Max QDA 2020 only affect the Max QDA standard program, the functions, the qualitative and mixed methods analysis functions. There are no changes to the Max Dictio uh, module, which is the quantitative text analysis module in Max QDA Plus, and no changes to the statistics module in the Analytics Pro version of the program. But of course, because Max QDA Plus and Analytics Pro also include the standard program, there are new versions of these programs, but all of the changes take place in the, in the basic part of the program. So here is a, a, a brief agenda of, or summary of the changes as I'm going to talk about them. There's no single big idea in this new version of our much loved program. Rather, there are a surprising number of evolutionary changes uh, that are designed to make workflows smoother by concentrating improvements on core functionality and research methods. Please regard the next few minutes not so much as a training session, as a, but as a source of ideas and inspiration. Uh, you'll be able to read up much more about any of the new functions later. So my objective today is to give you a taste for lots of things and an idea of the range of new toys that are now available. So let's just uh, move into the program. The main changes are to memoing, and, or the most apparent changes, are to memoing and the Max Maps routines uh, and their interfaces. But before I look at those, I need to show you a host of enhancements on the main four interface windows. Uh, and so that's where we'll start. Uh, now, one of the uh, things that uh, they've added in uh, this time is that if you start a new project, uh, a completely new project, you will not see the retrieved segments window. That's uh, because when you first open a new project, you haven't got any data in it. Your first task is to bring data in and uh, create and apply codes. There's nothing to retrieve, so you don't need that window clogging up your space. But of course, you can always restore it by coming to the home menu or home ribbon uh, and clicking on it there. But I'll, I'm going to work without it for a moment. Now, the first idea, which is quite big, uh, is that they have introduced a preferences button uh, on the toolbar of each of the four panels. It's this little gear wheel button here. So here is the preferences for the document system. There is a preferences uh, for the document browser and so on, the code system and the retrieve segment. So I'll start off by going around these, which are largely new possibilities, new functions. So let's look at the document system first of all. So here's the little menu of preferences for the document system. You've got the possibility of setting a tick that all documents as you open them are added on to separate tabs so that you can have multiple open documents if you want. Uh, I'm going to leave that off because it, it, it wouldn't help my demonstration, but some people quite like that. Next and more significant, you've got the possibility of displaying selected variables from your document variables uh, part of the program in the tooltip when you hover over uh, uh, a document. So if I hover, I'll just close that and hover over documents here now. Uh, I haven't ticked it. So at the moment, when I hover over the documents, we get this information. We can see when the document was created uh, and how many memos it's got and things like that. Uh, but if I come back and put a tick in here, uh, we now, when we hover over it, see three variables, their age, their relationship status, and their education. And we have control of those variables through this select variables facility function. So if I click on this now, I can see all of the document variables in this example data. I'm just using the standard uh, example. Uh, so if I add the gender with variables, say with a click and tick OK, now, when I hover over one of them, I can also see the, the gender uh, that they have declared. So we've got the George is male and so on. So that gives us some extra information possibilities. Let's go back to here. Um, and we've got the possibility now of setting a setting when we import photographs and uh, uh, sorry, when we import text documents which contain photographs and other objects that we may not want 
uh, we can ask MaxQDA on import to ignore those objects. Uh, that's a fairly esoteric one. Uh, another quite useful one, insert new documents at the end. Those who have been using MaxQDA for a long time are well familiar with the fact that when you import a new document, uh, even if I, if I select uh, the New York group and go to import a document into it from here, I won't go through with it, um, the new document will be added at the top of the New York group. Now, with this setting, I can choose that all new documents get put at the bottom of each of the group where I've asked them to come, uh, so that I've got my initial documents. It means I can retain the order of uh, import if I want in the, in the uh, document system. So those are the preferences for the document system. Let's look at the preferences for the code system next. We've got rather more things here. And the first one is one that I know people have been asking for quite a long time, uh, the frequency information. We were all familiar, hopefully, with the fact that we've got the number of times each code has been used, its frequency, displayed in this column of the code system. We've now got a range of choices for the frequencies that can be displayed there. So the historical one has been coded segments in all documents, the total frequencies. But we could choose... Uh, have some documents activated and have the coded segments in just the activated documents or the coded segments in the opened document uh, or the number of document groups that contain the codes, the number of document sets or the number of documents. Let's click on that one now. So I've set display seek frequency at documents, close this and now these numbers are counting how many of our documents up here have contain the code at least once. So uh, we've got, I think, 10 interviews in this version of the example, uh, English language example project. So, uh, and m most of the coding has been done only in the documents, in, in the uh, text documents, the interviews. So none of these numbers go more than 10. Just to show you by going back, let's put it, restore it to all documents, coded segments in all documents, close that. And now we've got much larger numbers, for example, 61, segments coded to positive and so on. So more preferences. We can choose different uh, displays for the code system. Uh, so we could have it in a table view. If you're working very grounded using lots of emoticodes, you might choose to display only the emoticodes and not any other thematic codes. Uh, a new thing, by default, the focus group speaker codes and paraphrase segments codes, which are technical codes uh, created as part of the, the process of creating those particular analysis tools, those are now, by default, put to the bottom. But if you're working a lot with focus groups, you might not like to have your focus group speakers right down at the bottom, so you might want to instead, by putting a tick in here, have them up at the top. And just like the uh, new uh, insert new documents at the bottom, we now have insert new subcodes at the bottom of a code group. But we might overrule that uh, if we're working with new codes or in vivo coding or something called open coding, which is uh, a, a, another new feature. We might want to have those new codes inserted at the top, whereas other default new codes go further down. So various things uh, in there. Uh, and a strange one which I, puzzled me for a while, this sum up frequencies of subcodes. Uh, this is as it is at the moment. Look at this assessments group of codes. There are three subcodes here. We've got about 90 or to 100 codes there. If I minimize that group, MaxQDA displays, yes, there are exactly 100 uh, coded segments in this assessments group of codes. But if I take this tick off, sum up frequencies of subcodes, and then minimize the assessments group, I get zero because the assessments code itself has no subcodes. So I'm not quite sure what the analytic purpose is, but somebody's asked for that, and so they've got it. So those are the new preferences in the code system. Let's now turn our attention to the document browser and look at the preferences, the new preferences. Not very much here. Uh, and the first one in its English language version, I misunderstood this the first few times I read it. This tick means that if you copy and paste a text segment out of your document browser into something like a, a Word document or somewhere else, MaxQDA, with this tick in place, MaxQDA will include the source information. So the emphasis of the tick is the with. Uh, so 
the source information is the name of the document uh, and possibly the uh, paragraph number where the segment has come from, that sort of thing, will be part of what is copied to the clipboard, not only the text. Remove that tick and you'll only have just the source text, no metadata information about it. You can also choose, let me just move into a document which has got some coding here and come back again. I can choose to have my coding stripes on the right rather than the left. Uh, that's just a matter of preference. Uh, I'm going to stick with them on the left. And we've got a, a chance to choose how many codes to have in the quick list. The quick list, remember, is the little list here at the top of the in the coding toolbar. Uh, can I open it? I've only got two codes in it at the moment. Uh, but uh, that preference, we can set a maximum higher or lower uh, to our whatever we like. So those are the new preferences in the document browser. Let's open up the retrieved segments. Quite a lot of changes have happened in the retrieved segments. So not just the preferences, but we'll start with the preferences and just have a little look at the preferences. OK, I've got more things to talk about in the retrieve segments, but the preferences uh, give us a choice of four sequences that we can choose to display retrieve segments. The classic one was always ordered by the document system, although there were ways of changing it to order your retrieve segments by code system. But we can now also order by weight score, ascending or descending. Uh, and we've got three different views now. There were two views before, what Max Goudier now calls the classic view and the table view. We've now got something called list view, and those become more apparent in a moment when I come back to the retrieve segments and talk about the other changes. But those were the changes to the preferences. Now, there are some other layout and other kinds of changes have taken place. So let me now go around the four windows looking at the other kinds of changes uh, that, that, uh, that we've got here. First of all, in the document system, I'm going to concentrate on the document system again. Let's make this blank. We've got some simpler activation tools is a, a, a very nice new change. The, um, those tooltips are rather annoying when I hover over them for too long. You remember in the past, you could activate a document by getting a very precise click on the little gray disk just to the left of the document. Well, now you can activate by clicking on the document icon. See, Max has been activated. You can also activate a document by clicking on the uh, code frequency over here. If I click on this 24, Robin gets activated. So to, no, no uh, control keys or anything else, just a simple click on those. And the same works if I reset. The same works for the uh, document group. There I've activated all the New York document group and I can activate all of Indiana that way. So uh, those are some simplified activations and there are equivalents in the code system. Very exciting in this role of activation. Up in the toolbar, there's a button which has been here for quite a long time called activate by document variable. Well, this the functions of this have been changed a little bit. If I click on it, we've now got three choices of activate by. We can either activate by variables as in the past, or we can activate documents by color. We haven't got very much color. We've only got two different document colors in there, so not very exciting on that one. But a very exciting new one, we can choose to activate a random selection of documents. Now, this could be very, very useful if you've got a large document system and you want to test something across just a sample of your documents, but you don't want any particular set or group of documents. You really want a genuine random subset. You've got the possibility. If I click on this, we've got a, a counter. It tells me there are 20 documents in the project. Uh, so if I push this up to, say, five and click on OK, uh, I get a random five activated documents. Interestingly, I've got only two interview documents, Max and Alex, and it's chosen to interview the audio transcript example, a document from the literature and one picture. So that is a truly random split across this document system. Uh, so that's an exciting new feature. So that was activate by, and also you can activate focus group speakers by variables from that, again, for those working in focus groups. And then there are just a few changes in the context menu. So if I do a right click on, uh, on say, Max as a document and look at the uh, possibilities here. Um, an exciting thing here is I've got the possibility of jumping straight from the document system into Max Maps and create opening up 
one of four possible models in Max Maps based on the document Max. So I don't have to open Max Max and come and select uh, Max. That's perhaps an unfortunate name. Let me just uh, do it on George again. So open up a, a, a Max Map on Case George. If I, if I, I went that way. Uh, and if I look at the uh, a group header and the context menu for the New York group, I've got some more sort options here. So halfway down the context menu, we've got the sort documents. We've always had to ascend alphabetically ascending or descending. But now we've got some extra choices. We can uh, sort according to when a document was last modified in ascending or descending or the text length, sort into the largest documents first or the smallest documents first. So some new possibilities of reorganizing your document system with those sort functions. Now we'll move to the code system and look at new things in the code system. So just the same as the document system, you can activate a code now with a single click on its uh, icon or a single click on its frequency number there and reset. That all works the same. But you'll notice when I hover over a code here, such as grandparents, two new buttons have appeared along the row. The little plus button will open up a new code. Uh, let me put this onto siblings because that might be useful place I can make a new code. Open that up. I get the possibility of a new code, which I'm going to call brothers because siblings are brothers and sisters. Uh, and I can choose to use the color of the parent code and I can create a code memo as always before. And OK, there we are. There is my new code brothers created as a subcode of siblings just with one click. Come on here again, do another one and I could create the equivalent sisters code. Except I. Uh... There we go. And OK. And I've got my brothers and sisters as possible subcodes from siblings. The X, I hope intuitively, is a delete code function, so we can, we can actually delete uh, any code at any stage we want. And even more significant, we have uh, a merge option. If you click on a code, uh, let me just uh, click on partner for a moment and start to drag it. When I come in the usual sort of way, we get the underlining to drop it as a the same level as that. So I could, if I wanted to move partner up to immediately under parents and drop it there, that's unchanged. If I want to make partner a subcode of parents, as always, that has, is unchanged. But there is one other possibility. If I move along here, the word merge appears. So if I were to release my mouse button at this point, partner would be merged into the parents code along with all of its subcodes. So partner has now gone and the parents code uh, displays a little plus symbol to show that it's had something added to it and so on. I don't want that to stand so I'm going to use the undo button to restore hopefully. Did it do it? Yes partner has come back there and if I want to drag it down and put it under friends I can do so. There we are. So I've restored my partner with its associated things, but I've still got the subcodes for siblings. So one click merge or click and drag merge is a new function, but it does mean you've got to be a little bit careful if you're moving things around your code system. There are now three possibilities when you release your mouse button dragging up. You might make it move it to a different place at the same level, make it a subcode or merge it depending on exactly how you drop those those buttons. So those are uh, some of the new things in the activation. In the context menu, uh, quite exciting. If I right click on a siblings code to look at its context menu, right up at the top, we've got activate documents containing this code. This is a new function. Click on this and I can see that Max, George, Vinny, Alex, Jamie and Devin are the ones who have coded segments coded to siblings. I've activated the subgroup of documents that have brothers and sisters if I want to focus on that. I can obviously cancel that in the usual sort of way. And another uh, one that uh, might need to get your head around a little bit, is duplicate a code with its coded segments. Now what this means is it'll create an identical additional code and all the coded segments will be attached to it, which you could then use to change in some way, leaving your original code unaffected. 
So it'll make two codings everywhere. If I did it now for this partner code, there'll be two partner codes. Let's uh, let's do that. So now we've got partner and partner one. They've each got 12 segments attached to them. Uh, if I open up the retrieve segments um, and uh, and activate uh, some documents uh, and activate the partner code and go and look at it in context. Here we are. We've got partner and partner one, two identical code brackets. They've both got exactly the same segment, but I could then make changes to partner one, move on and edit that in some way that I'm not thinking of at the moment. And I've got a new data. So that is duplicate a code. I don't want, I'm going to uh, reset my activations, I don't want that. So I'm going to delete that code with the one click there and I've got rid of partner one. There we are, we're no longer duplicated. So that was another code system. Uh, and I think I've already mentioned by default, the focus group and paraphrase segments go down to the bottom. Let's now look at the document browser, uh, get rid of the retrieve segments and uh, I'll go back to Jamie. Right, several things have changed in the document browser. So hang on to your hats. The edit function has been moved. Remember, the edit button was here up on the top toolbar. Uh, some people found it rather difficult to find in amongst the icons here. So they've made a much bigger icon to show edit mode, and it's got a little bit of color to it. So when edit mode is on, there's a green tag, and the edit thing looks as though it slides like a switch across. So edit mode is now on. As before, when we're in edit mode, we get a word processing toolbar added at the top of the document browser. That's a really big clue that you're in editing mode. When I click that the other way, that toolbar disappears when we come out of editing mode. So that's the editing mode one. But a, an, another very significant change is this icon on the main toolbar, which introduces a new sidebar on the right hand side of the document browser. Now, there are three different things that you can display in this sidebar. And if I do a right click in the sidebar to get the context menu, I get the choices. We can choose. Oh, each time you change a choice, it closes. So at the moment, I'm going to display memos in this sidebar. Uh, close that and scroll down in Jamie and here is a memo. So we get the full text of a memo displayed in this sidebar. It's also available as before over here with the still with the hover over. Um, but I've got a down arrow to jump to the next memo because I think by looking over here, I can see from the tooltip that there are three memos in this document, jolly good. So I can move between those three with these up and down arrows, because at the moment I'm displaying memos in this sidebar. Come into the context menu. I could also display comments. So now both memos and comments. So comments are the comments on uh, data segments, coded segments. Remember the little comments? If I um, click on here and I can edit a comment, quickly comment here, click OK. That has a little solid disk in the middle and here is my comment being displayed in addition to memos uh, in this margin. So memos and comments. The context menu also offers me paraphrases, but I can't have all three together. When I put a click on paraphrases and come in again, you'll discover that comments have gone. So I can have memos plus comments or memos plus paraphrases, but I can't have comments plus paraphrases or all three. I haven't got any paraphrases at the moment, so I'll just stick with memos in that margin. So that's quite a big change uh, to bring that side panel in. Another one, in the middle, if I go to the context menu here in the uh, middle of the document browser, uh, we've got the possibility here to convert to line numbered text. We effectively have a toggle between counting paragraph numbers or counting line numbers. I've just clicked it. It gives me the possibility to choose how long lines I want. Let's make this 85 just for the sake of showing how I can change it. Click OK. It's now converting. And now every line in the uh, document browser has a line number. So this first section of Jamie's interview now is made up of some six or seven lines of data. If I move the margin boundary, this makes it even more clear how these lines are working because the lines wrap 
because the, the uh, it's not no longer 85 characters wide and so the lines look rather awkward so you do need to match your display space to the line length that you've chosen uh, to make this work properly but now I can select a line if I want I want to code a segment just to a line rather than to a whole paragraph and if I want to code the whole paragraph when I'm in line mode I'll have to do a lot of paste painting uh, I think you'll probably find so that's a little toggle so right click anywhere and I can convert it back to paragraph number text so here is the conversion going and now we're back again here is the paragraph four all as one single paragraph and now this paragraph will wrap uh, sensibly on shorter or longer lines so that's line or paragraph numbering now grounded theorists should like the next one in the uh, coding toolbar, there is a new button here in the middle of the coding toolbar, which opens something called open coding mode. If I select this so that it's grayed, uh, so that shows we are now in open coding mode, we can now code much more intuitively and inductively because, uh, let's say, just for the sake of argument, uh, Jamie is talking about music here, so I may want to code this to a code music. As soon as I've painted a, se a selection with my mouse, when I release the mouse button, up comes the coding dialog, asking me what do I want to call this code, so I'm going to call it music. It gives me the chance to uh, choose a color for it. Let's have, a, uh, let's, let's have the, the, the green. I can create a code memo if I want music ideas uh, and I can make a comment on the coded segment as well if I want uh, comment on music I'm devoid of inspiration at the moment uh, and click OK so now a new code music has been added in my code system uh, look back at the preferences I don't think I'd put Oh, it's a new subcodes at the bottom. Uh, that's interesting. So that new one has gone to the top of the code system. Ah, oh, no, because I've got open coding, insert new codes at the top, it's gone to the top. Uh, if I've got an insert new codes at a current location, music might have gone somewhere else. So there is an interaction between open coding mode and the preferences in the code system. But come back to what we I did here I not only created a code music but it was also applied straight away to the data segment which I had highlighted there so let's highlight another sentence down here uh, and this is something about broken bones uh, and we could give this a, a, a different uh, color and I could likewise create a code memo and so on click OK and there we are, there's a new broken bones code added up there and it's been applied down here with its purple color and so on. So open coding mode is a toggle. We can turn it on and off. You probably don't want to have open coding mode on unless you really want to do open coding because otherwise every time you highlight some data, you'll get the code dialog. I've got it off now, so I don't get the new code dialog. It'd be annoying to keep on having the new code every time I've painted something. So you'd normally work not in open coding mode, and then when you're in a really inductive frame of mind, uh, turn on open coding mode, and you can create lots of new codes very inductively as you work through. It seems to me that's even better than the old in vivo coding, because uh, the in vivo coding, you were just being lazy about the code name, but in order to get sensible code names, you could only highlight a short bit of data so that looks like a really good thing uh, and so on and lastly staying here in the document browser uh, if I go to the context menu in the code margin here oh before I do this hang on cancel I want to uh, no I don't need an activation no, that's that's Let's, let's just activate the assessment codes. Uh, context menu in the code margin. We've got a new feature down here. Yes, uh, to shade, color code the text, to shade the text with the color. If I click on that, uh, I can restrict it to only activated codes. So now I've just got three codes activated, positive, ambivalent, and negative, which got three different colors. Click OK. And those codes are shaded, but the music code is not being shaded. The broken bones code, uh, oh, that is, uh, no, that's um, uh, something else must be coded to it. Oh, the positive. 
uh, segment is coded to the same thing as broken bones. <laughs> okay, uh, slightly unintended consequence or effect, but that's color shading for selected codes in your code system, uh, and it's dead easy to do that with activation. So that's these the interaction of these two. If I take that click off, all text will be color shaded, and we get lots of overlapping colors, uh, and that doesn't work nearly so well. So let's take the color shading off. And remember, you can hide code brackets by unticking their colors here. You can temporarily filter them out and so on. Uh, let's take that off. So those were changes to the document browser. Retrieve segments. Now, here's a biggie. Let's uh, come back and think about what we've changed in the retrieve segments. So. Let me activate uh, some documents. So we'll have the New York uh, documents and we've got some assessments activated. So now we've got some data into the retrieve segments. I've got seven documents, four codes, 62 retrieve segments, very much that, that uh, status bar works as before. But the appearance of the retrieve segments panel has changed. So let's look at, look at what's going on down here. The, segments are currently being grouped by their document source. So the first interview in the document system is with Max. So we have all of the um, segments attached to any of these assessment codes for Max are listed in a whole group here, scroll down quite a long way until we come to Joanna, and then we get all of Joanna's segments, and then scroll down and we get George's segments and so on. Let's come back to Joanna. Underneath Joanna, we have some variable information about Joanna, which is obviously common to all of the data segments. And then underneath each data segment, we have its source, not only the name, but also the paragraph or line number, if we had coded by line numbers from the start, and the name of the code under which it's being retrieved is being displayed here, uh, positive, negative, uh, uh, and so on. So that's how this is working at the moment. But remember the preferences, we could order instead of by document system, we could order these same retrievals by code system. Now, if I scroll up to the top, I get all of the positive codes first. And now I can see that the first few ones are from Max's interview, scroll down a bit, and eventually we come to Joanna's interview and then scroll down further and we'll come to somebody else, George, and so on. These are all the positive uh, uh, coded segments and then further on down we'll come to the ambivalent and the negatives and so on. So this is where the preferences interact. Now I'm not going to go on to weight scores and so on. I'm going to go back to my ordered by document system but I'm sure you can guess the others. Um, but there are three new buttons here which are affecting uh, this display in this list view. So this one, when I hover over it, display origin. If I untick that, we no longer have any information under each of these segments. So we're getting Max's segments completely unfiltered or, or without anything distracting in between. We have the code bracket, which by its color, because these three codes, four codes all have different colors, the color of the code bracket is a good clue uh, as to which code is being shown here. In your own data, that might be quite sufficient, so you may not need all those, those information, and you may not need to know the paragraph or line number that something is coming under. Uh, if I want to jump to the segment in the document browser, click on the code bracket on any of these displays, and that does the synchronization job, displays the same code up here in the document browser as down here, uh, and these others have synchronized around that as well. So that's, that's still there, but you get it by clicking on the code bracket. Um, and this button here, let's restore the uh, 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 origin um, information. This one controls the display of the variables the age, relationship status, and education variables we're displaying here. So click on that, and those variables disappear. I'm just seeing Max. I'm not interested in anything about how old Max is, and so on. Now, I want to make a big point here. These variables look very similar to the variables we were talking about over here, where we were displaying variables in the document system. But they are controlled in different ways. The variables in the document system are controlled from the preferences dialog, 
these variables are controlled from the variables menu the list of document variables and it's by putting a tick in the favorite variable column here so if I untick relationship status and put a tick in the gender box and close this we should get a different effect down here now we see gender age and education I've changed the variable display there by going through the list of document variables up here this toggle doesn't control the selection it simply turns the display on or off and this one opens up another margin to the right which would display comments if we had them in this example we haven't got very much in the way of comments uh, so I'm not seeing any there at the moment but that's what that one is for come back to the preferences and now you can see the difference between the three views down here so I've been working on the new list view for Max QDA 2020 switch to the classic view and this is what you've been seeing for years and years this goes back uh, three or four versions at least of Max QDA in appearance so if you're stuck on that and want to stay with it by all means and similarly the table view uh, has also been around as a possibility for a long time but where we used to have buttons up here uh, on the toolbar to switch between those table and classic views now they're in the preferences one but I'm going to stick to the list view because my brief today is to show you what's new and this list view is definitely new last thing for the retrieve segments uh, you'll notice a new word W symbol for uh, MS Microsoft Office Word the export formats from Max QDA are no longer RTF in the, for the document format uh, they are Word DocX if I click on the export function you'll see the export type this dialog hasn't changed in any other respect but the first option used to sort of say rich text format and RTF uh, along with Excel and HTML now it only offers you DocX Word document format I, I guess it does something very similar on Mac computers, but because I'm working in Windows, I'm being offered DocX. I'm going to cancel that. I don't want to go through with that. But that is the export, uh, either export through this export function or simply open your coded segments as a Word document uh, directly with that button there. Uh, but that is the new format. Right. Time to change to something else. Let's move the retrieve segments down a little bit. Let's uh, reset our activations to get rid of everything. Um, and let's uh, close the Max document here. I don't want that. Um, and we're here with Jamie in the document browser. Right, I'm now going to start talking about memos uh, because this is another big area of change. We've already seen that uh, uh, memos uh, appear in a margin that we can open or close uh, with a toggle here on the document browser toolbar so we can move around our documents reading the memos uh, in full in this part of the window but those of you who are alert will have noticed that there is a new uh, option on the menu toolbar up in the top of the window up here called memos with its own ribbon so uh, this is the new memos menu that's a different one to say quickly with a set of options uh, and lots of things have changed here let's just open up a free memo first of all to look at the actual memo window the memo editor because this looks a little bit different from before uh, and some functionality has changed so you can type anything here just so I've got a little bit of text so that's as before uh, we can uh, edit its uh, title if we want um, I really want to talk and type at the same time I find so I can edit the title the uh, memo symbol buttons we've got the same set of symbols except possibly a new one RQ which I think stands for research questions or research question or something like that so uh, and we can as before we can set the types of the menu with a little preferences section here so click on that and we can create our own labels for these if we want so there we are. I've created the research questions label 
So now when I hover over that, it will show research questions. I haven't got labels for any of the others, but this is to help you use your labels in a creative and consistent fashion. Down at the bottom, we've got some new sections here. Now it's always been possible to link memos to codes simply by dragging and dropping a code in here. So let's just drag in the friends code. Uh, but now we can link a memo to coded segments if we want. So if illustrating something in our free memo, uh, we want to illustrate it with um, a, a coded segment here, uh, we can drag that coded segment and drop it in there. There we are. So I've linked this memo. You can type anything here to the code friends with that link there and to a data segment in the Jamie interview with that there. Let's close. Uh, anything else I want to show in that? There is possible, I, I won't go through with it, the possibility of using uh, document links. You can even link a segment in your memo to a an uncoded, if you like, data segment in your data. Uh, but I'm not going to go through with that. It's a little bit fiddly and I'm getting a little bit short of time. So I close that new free memo. Let me now open up uh, the memo manager part of the program. If I open it on the free memos uh, here, I will see the new memo manager with just my one memo I've just created here. Free memos, free edited title. You can see its title there displayed. Not very exciting. But this memo manager screen now tells me how many memos of each type currently exist in this project. Uh, so if I open up the code memos as well with a click on there, I've now got my free memos and my code memos coming down here. I can click on my friend's code memo and read it over here if I want. So I can read and edit if I want the friends. This is the code memo for the code friends and so on. I can remove the free memos from the list if I clicking there. Let's look at the in document memos and take out the code memos. Uh, this gets more exciting now. I've got rather more memos being displayed. There are nine in document memos. So now I've got a scroll bar down the side here to see all of my in document memos. And I've got the possibility of organizing the memos over here in this left hand part of the screen. I could uh, group and or minimize the groups of memos for if, if I want uh, to get if I've got a very long list and I want to concentrate on certain individual documents and focus on their memos. I can reorganize this with the this uh, uh, one uh, so I can resort my memos by date. If I try to find a memo uh, and I know roughly when it was created, this might be a, a, a way of reducing my search down to come and find a particular memo and then uh, click on it uh, and that would open it here in this window again. Uh, come back and reorganize over here back to origin and click on the top of the list and we get all of the memos back um, and so on. So lots of things you can do here. There is a filter uh, option in the display here. I could choose to filter by who created the memos the dates on which memos were created. Let me just uh, deselect all of them and just have all of the question memos and close that. And there we are. I've just got the five filter is active, five of nine memos. Five memos have got the query symbol so I can focus on a group of memos uh, or, or, or a kind of subset of memos like that. And this X will close the filter, restore all of the memos there. So uh, lots of things we can do there with those. And we've got a new sets group down here at the bottom of the list. So you could now create some memo sets. We've been able for a long time to create document sets and code sets. So now in the same sort of way, we can create memo sets, which is great. Um, let me go back uh, back to my um free memo that I created earlier on because there's something else I've just realized I forgot to show. Come here to the edit, turn down with a right click context menu or when I'm in the memo manager one up here, you can insert a table inside a memo. So let's say a table with two columns and four rows. 
And there we are. Uh, there, there is my, my table. I can move it down by putting uh, some enter keys above it. And I can select any cell and type some data in there, and over here, and type some data in there, and so on. So I could create a little table inside a memo if it had some meaning in terms of uh, my analysis work. So with all of those changes, uh, I think it's safe to say that the uh, um, uh, creators of MaxQDA really want us to write more memos and do more work in memos. And on those lines, I would just like to point out that almost all research uh, has as its ultimate goal at least a presentation, but most likely writing. Articles, journal articles, books maybe. You're going to have to write at some stage. MaxQDA is giving you these memo tools so that you can start writing at a much, much earlier stage. You don't have to do all of your analysis, lots of coding and generating uh, reports from that, and then sit down and write your conclusions. You get ideas as you go along. Put them into memos, particularly free memos where they're new and exciting ideas, and you can start your writing from day one. You might write something in a memo on day one that makes it all the way through uh, and ends up in your final thesis. Wouldn't that be fantastic? OK, so 10 more minutes. And I'm now going to move on and talk about Max Maps. Let's go to the visual tools and open up Max Maps. There are some visual changes to Max Maps and uh, there are some fundamental changes as well. I think I'm going to display this uh, by starting a new empty map. So let me just start a new map. I've got an empty map and I'll go to the insert function. And let's start off before going to Max Models. Let's just get this idea around some of the tools in Max QDA. So I've got these standard objects I can bring in. If I'm making a concept map, I might choose uh, uh, to uh, ha have a couple of objects and perhaps an, uh, one of these big uh, arrow tools and things. Those have always, whoops, what did I do there? I didn't mean to do that. Uh, those have been there for some time. But what we've got newly added are lines. I can just drag in a straight line uh, and I can move this line around. I can make it longer, uh, add bits to it, move its point around. I've got two different lines here uh, joining together. Again, not quite sure what I did there. Uh, so we've got three lines. That is a definite new. We can all also add in uh, photographs. Uh, graphics and so on, and we can bring in objects from libraries and so on. Once I uh, have imported a few objects, if I select the objects, I just clicked on this square, the ribbon menus at the top changed to the format ribbon. Now, we used to have uh, a right panel down the right hand side where you could set all of the formats for your objects. They're now in a menu up, across the top. So let's look at this uh, square that I've got here. If I want to make it bigger, I can increase its size by uh, clicking on that. But if I, I could also got two buttons here where I can make it, I can stretch it in either direction independently. If I untick that, uh, I could make it by making it, I could stretch it sideways. Can you see it growing sideways? And by uh, shrinking it down there, I could even make it even thinner and wider. So that's one way I could, under control, uh, change the shape of the object. Um, uh, let's come down to this arrow. Uh, by playing with the backgrounds and the borders, the colors here, so uh, the background color, let's give its background color yellow. Perhaps I should be doing these colors. Oh, let's try this. That's the line color. Ah, OK. Select here. So, ah, that, sorry, I was doing the colors for the label. That border, that background and border is that for a, a label. These are where I do the, uh, the colors. So the background color, I wanted to have that as yellow. There we are. Now I've got my, my object with a red border and a, a yellow background. And if I want to make the line thicker, uh, up to, say, five pixels, uh, I do that. So I've now got a much thicker line. Uh, I can still move it around anywhere that I want. If I come to the insert, 
come to the start button, I want to link that with a line to something else like that. Oops, link it with a line down to that arrow. I can do so. OK, uh, come back. If I select the line, I've got some new formatting options for the line. Uh, I can choose if I want to label the line. Uh, so let's say I want to give this the uh, uh, label. Uh, how do I label the line? Right click, uh, add label. There we go. Context menu, add label. So I want to call have the label causes. Type that in. Uh, I get causes horizontally, but if I select that, I could choose to make label the label run exactly up the line and then if I move this around that makes it a little bit more sense uh, whereas having that uh, uh, going across the line oh, okay so I've got different possibilities I'm still learning how these things work with this new version so you've got a lot more possibilities for making your maps pretty and one that I quite like uh, with these linking lines you don't have to have them only straight. Uh, we might decide we want to have this as a, uh, actually I want to have it that way, curved line, that this causes this uh, with a sort of swirly line. And when I move that around, the swirl gets even more apparent and so on. Uh, somebody's opened up their microphone. Please uh, don't use your microphone. Uh, otherwise, your background office disturbs everybody else in the webinar. Thank you. So some new tools particularly around the linking of lines and some new objects. Now, let's have a look now at the left-hand panel, uh, because there are some significant changes that have taken place over here in the Maps panel, uh, the list of maps, which is turned on and off with this, this button here on the menu. We've got the possibility of creating some document folders. So Demo Maps, I could have a folder for Demo Maps, and I could drag my new map into it. And I can edit its name, hopefully, or right click. Uh, will it allow me to rename it? Ah, no, it's not. Ah, now I can rename it. Object demo. And I've got a comments possibility here as well. So if I click on this, I can add a comment to my map called object demo. Uh, this map is to show some new objects there we go okay and now when i hover over that in classic style i can read that memo so if you create multiple maps that are quite similar you can distinguish them with comments rather than having to invent very elaborate names and so on uh, that might be useful and by grouping your maps into new folders uh, you'll find those uh, more useful Let's now uh, look at the models. Now we've got some new uh, preset models, so many that in fact Max QDA has now given us two different groups, document models and code models. Let's just look at the list. Uh, I haven't got time to go through these, but we'll just look at, let's look at the single case model code hierarchy, for example. So I'm creating that model now by selecting it. This is unchanged from before. If I select uh, a document such as Jamie and move it over here, what is new is that I'm now being shown a preview of the model. Previously, you had to sort of create the model, and then if you didn't like what you've got, you had to delete it and start again. But now I have a preview. I can choose whether I want to use the model or cancel. Maybe I picked the wrong document. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to do it for Jamie. OK, cancel. Choose the model again. I do have to go back to that. And let's bring in somebody else. Let's bring in Alex. OK, that's the one I want. But now I've got these various other things. Do I want to have uh, code memos? OK, put a tick and it shows me what it's going to look like with the code memos. Don't like that. Take that out. Memos linked with codes. Oh, there's a free edited uh, memo uh, which is linked uh, to a code somewhere okay so i might decide i want that how many levels do i want to display codes on and so on so we can play around uh, uh, with this and see different effects as we change uh, these uh, things okay 
Uh, sorry, someone is just trying to send me a message saying they've got to go. So let me just uh, uh, just see what, what they were saying. Uh, someone called Yuri is paying compliments. He says, I've been using MassQDA for 15 years and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So uh, you're going to like this new version, Yuri, I'm quite sure. Uh, but thanks, thanks for your comment and good luck. So when you're satisfied with what you've created, you just click on the use model and the model is now created, added up at the top of the list. So now I can move it down here uh, into the uh, document models. There we are. I can add a comment to it and so on. And now I can carry on playing. I can still move things around within the model uh, if I want. Uh, if I want to enhance it, I can bring in other things and so on. Uh, but this creation stage, I think, is fantastic that we get this view. Um, let's just go back to the start uh, and quickly do the same with a code model, uh, say hierarchical codes, subcodes model. Uh, let's bring in the um, assessments code and see we just get those little things. And I can choose uh, change uh, things on there and so on. So I'm going to cancel that because that wasn't a very good model. OK, so that was Max Maps, a whole load of new things. Lots of exciting things in there. Very briefly, bear with me. I will talk quite quickly. Uh, the other things are quite simple, but I do need to show you some important things. On the import ribbon, we have some new things in the uh, reference manager data area. So we now have imports from three reference managers, EndNote, Mendeley, and Zotero. Uh, and with these, if you have the metadata uh, for your references, as well as the source documents, PDF versions of journal articles, quite possibly, MaxQDA can import both, both the reference data, the, 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 the referencing data, and the full text articles uh, as part of that import. If that's useful to you, please explore that in the new manual. Uh, and also, if you are importing like that, you can ask MaxQDA uh, to ignore duplicates, not double import what you've already got, and even do some autocoding for keywords as part of the import process. Exciting things there. Even more exciting over on the transcripts is MaxQDA has some, auto some more imports of automatic transcription formats. So looking at the list here, this is the way to have a look at it. If you want to use any of the transcript, automated transcript programs that I'm seeing there, such as F4, F5 transcript or uh, Amber script and so on, if you can see it in that list, you've got a very good chance that MaxQDA will be able to quite simply and directly import your automatically created transcript uh, directly along with the audio. So lots of new automatic transcription things have been added there. Just a couple of things have been added in analysis. If you use summaries, for this I need to open a different project. Uh, so let me just go and open uh, uh, a similar but different project where I've got a whole lot of summaries. Um, uh, this is an underappreciated part of MaxQDA, I suspect. Uh, the summary tools come to my analysis room. This is a form of data reduction that is done after coding. So I've got the standard example project, English language example project, and I've gone into the summary grid. Everywhere where there's a blue dot, we have data uh, coded, and there might be multiple segments. Everywhere where there is a blue dot surrounded by a green shading, we've not only got multiple segments, but we have created a summary of the data in this middle screen here. So this is data reduction. We've gone from this uh, amount of data to this amount of data, summarizing everything we know about Joanna uh, and how she talks about her parents on here. We can move to somebody else. John, we've got uh, four data segments coded to partner for John, and we've summarized all of, we've reduced all of that middle column of data down to this summary. Now, it's been possible up until now uh, to go move from those summaries to a table where we look at uh, uh, themes like emotions, parents and partner. And we can move these around and uh, this has always been possible. But we can look at how John has talked about his parents and how he's talked about it. We're now looking at the summaries in place of all those long lists of data. 
Uh, and we've always been able to look at this in two ways, just switching the rows and columns. Now I've got the people in columns. The new thing that MaxQDA 2020 gives us is what it calls, I'm closing these down, the Summary Explorer. And this works with document groups or sets to group them together. So if I drag in here uh, the groups of documents separated by gender, male and female, uh, and we also had um, an emotions code I can bring in here and create the summary explorer. Now I have the summary data, the same segments, but one for each person. And I could have, but I'm grouping now all the boys, John, George and Vincent in this column, the girls, Joanna, Mary, Kelly in this column. And I can look at how girls have talked about their parents in summary form. I can scroll a long list. The columns will scroll independently of each other. Uh, so I could make, I could, if I want, I could compare what Grace has said by putting the Grace alongside John in a much longer or uh, shorter list. If I uh, move John up and move Grace up, now I'm getting closer to making a direct comparison of Grace to John and so on. You have to use a bit of imagination there. And I can switch to a different code and look at a different theme. But my columns are working on the document sets here uh, very much. So I'm just using the male and female groups. But bear in mind uh, that you can, uh, with your variables and your from the uh, mixed methods uh, activate by document variables, you can create uh, lots of different ways of making document groups and create sets from those which can then be used in that uh, explorer. So that was the Summary Explorer, looking at summary data combined with variable data. Uh, let me go back uh, to my uh, original uh, new features webinar that I was working with. Uh, get back to the original data for that. There is a similar thing has been added now, another new thing in the analysis ribbon for paraphrases. Uh, we have something called the paraphrases matrix. Now, Paraphrases look a little bit like summaries. They are reduced data in your own words and so on. But there's a fundamental timing difference. Paraphrasing takes place at the very start of your project before you've done any coding. With paraphrasing, you reduce the data into paraphrases and then you code the paraphrase data. With summaries, you code the full data and then you summarize the coded segments. Get the difference? Uh, but we can have a, a paraphrase matrix uh, by documents. So now I've just got, uh, we haven't got very many paraphrases at the moment in this example project, but I can just look at the few that we have got because Joanna and George. So I can now read George's interview in sort of paraphrased format and get a quick picture of what George has talked about by looking at the paraphrases. Uh, and that may give me an alternative route into my data. And this new paraphrases matrix, uh, which has been added to the paraphrase options on the analysis ribbon, that gives me a useful way in.